Y'all are awake this morning. You can go ahead and sit down. <laughs> I'm so, Yeah, we are now, right? After the time change and some of the snow. Did you all enjoy Pennsylvania's like fall, spring, and second winter that we experienced all in one weekend? It was a good time. I like went out to my car yesterday, later in the day, to go somewhere, and I looked out and I was like, "Oh, like my car is clear. This is great. Like, don't have to scrape it." And I like walked around to the other side, and it was just like a sheet of ice because it was the side the wind had been blowing against. And I was like, "Never mind. I have to like scrape off my entire door to open it." It was it was a good time. It was like winter. One last car scraping. It got me. But it's good to see you guys here this morning. My name is Lindsay. Um, we're gonna do the bucket offering first. So if my ushers could come up for the bucket offering. We're going to do that. If you could pass out those buckets so then you guys can get started. Um, Our bucket offering is currently going to um, help with relief in Ukraine and Russia. Um, We're working through World Help and MCC are the two organizations that we're um, giving funds to to help with that. So thank you for your donations. Um, As far as announcements, just a couple of quick reminders. Um, One of them is that Bible quizzing, we're in the last... The last part of the Bible quizzing season, they have a tournament this weekend at LBC, um, and then they have their big invitational tournament next weekend, also at um, Lancaster Bible College. So if you'd like to see some quizzing, these are the last two weekends for that. Um, And then last week we had told you about a work day that we're having in April. Um, There's just a lot of stuff to do around the property to get ready for, um, kind of after the winter season, to get ready for spring and the mowing and stuff that needs to happen. So there's just a lot of grounds work that needs done. So we're going to have a work day on Saturday, April 9th. Um, There's a sign-up sheet for it. Um, If you are willing to help that day, please come out and help us out. Um, Also, another save the date, there's going to be a women's retreat from on May 13th through 15th. So there's going to be more details coming about that, but just ladies, put that on your calendar as a save the date for the women's retreat. Um, and then later this summer in July, July 10th is our baptism. We're going to be back at the Nafsigers. I don't know what we would do for a baptism without being at the Nafsigers. So we're going to have our, um, our normal summer baptism at the Nafsigers. If you would like to get baptized, please contact us um, soon so we can get started with that process. And the last thing to mention is that the trip to Guatemala is quickly approaching. Um, there's a group of 10 of us that are going, and we're going the last... Um, the last weekend of March. So we're still collecting matchbox cars to take down for the kids. So um, we're collecting those through, I think, the 20th, Sunday the 20th. Next Sunday? Next week is the last day to have, or is the last Sunday to have those in. So if you would like to donate some matchbox or Hot Wheels cars, please get those into us. Um, And with that, if you want to stand up and say good morning and welcome each other, we're going to keep worshiping.
says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but nothing so that I may gain Christ. Lord, we, we sing before you, Lord. We worship you knowing that you hold everything in your hands. You hold this whole world in your hands. Father, we know that an intimate relationship with you is all we need. The peace that you bring, that's all that we need. Knowing you it should be our primary goal on this earth, Lord. Because what you bring to our hearts and what you bring to our souls, Lord, it's it's unlike any other, anything else we can find in this world. God, this morning I pray we would, would lean into, um, into what you have called us to be as your children, and I pray that we would yearn to know you more this morning, Lord. I pray that every word that comes out of our mouth this morning, Lord, would be glorifying to you and would be in favor of you, Lord. God, we're so grateful that we can be a part of your family and be a part of that victory that you displayed on the cross, that victory that you displayed for us to be called your own, to be with you for eternity, Lord. We, we sing of that this morning. We sing of that victory that we have in your name and that we are a part of your family. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you.
that all things must come down. All strongholds must be broken in your name. Jesus, we pray over this morning, here in our church this morning, that strongholds would be broken in your name, Lord. Strongholds would be broken in our hearts that are keeping us from you, from knowing you more. I pray that walls would be torn down, Lord, in Jesus' name. And I pray across the world, Lord, as well, that all the strongholds that are keeping people from you, that they would be torn down, that your church would declare you as Lord and that you would reign here on earth, Lord, in our hearts. Father, we praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If the ushers could come up for our regular offering. If you would join me in prayer of the offering. Heavenly Father, we recognize you as the owner and master of everything. Um, and you are also a giver of good gifts. And the things that we have um, are just a reflection of your goodness to us. So Father, we graciously and humbly and generously um, give back to you um, just in honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can go ahead. This morning, our uh, our message will be from 1 Peter 2.18 to 3.12. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. And when he suffered, he didn't threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. All right, ladies, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah adored Abraham, calling him Lord. Our husbands would like that, wouldn't they? And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. All right, men. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the. Oh, hey, there we go. 
All right. We must have been getting to a good part, right? Man. All right. I'm going to go back to likewise husbands live with their wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. And finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you recall that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And I love this part. It's a promise for us. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Well, good morning. My name's Keith, and I'm one of the pastors here at Timberline, and this morning we are in week seven of an 11-week series looking at the book of 1 Peter, and as you can tell, we're tackling a pretty big chunk this morning. In hindsight, probably should have broken this up into two or three messages, but we'll try and uh, and get through it. Uh, Benji is away this weekend on some much-deserved vacation time with his family, Uh, hoping he actually gets home tomorrow. I'm not sure how much snow he got where he was at. Of course, I don't know if you'd maybe really mind being snowed in, so maybe that'd be all right. Uh, He will be back, though, next week, and he'll be back here in the saddle and taking over in 1 Peter, where we leave off today. And then uh, I will actually be gone for two, possibly three weeks, depending on our flights to Guatemala and how those things work out. So uh, Benji will be continuing on with the series, and uh, Dave King will be filling in a week there as well, and then I will be back to wrap things up uh, in April. And we'll be moving on to a new series, which we'll tell you more about later. So First uh, Peter is, if you've been with us, you know there's a book that was written to exiles and foreigners. And it was written to sojourners, those who find themselves far from home. It's a reminder to us that we are aliens and strangers and that this world is not our home. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And Christ is our king, and because of that, will always be a little out of place here in this life. We will always be homesick. And in the pages of this letter, we find a roadmap, we find instruction for finding our way and learning how to live far from home. So before we get into things any further, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, this world is not our home. And we acknowledge and recognize that we have a a citizenship with you, and that your Son is our King. Lord, forgive us for the times that we have settled in and made ourselves comfortable and that we have treated this world as our home. I pray, Lord, this morning that you would grant us open hearts, open minds, open ears, that we would hear the things that you have to say, that your Spirit would be moving and working, bringing conviction and bringing us to the truth. And Father, I pray that the things that that I would say that are not of you would simply fall by the wayside, but those things that you want to go forth and that you want uh, to have proclaimed uh, would go forth and bear much fruit. So, Father, thank you. We love you, and we commit this time into your care. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So, in 2001, Marvin Hemeyer was the owner of a small muffler repair shop in Granby, Colorado. Marvin had a beef with the local township zoning officials. Actually, he had several. It started with an issue over a sewage system. The township wanted him to have one, and he didn't. The township wanted him to properly dispose of his sewage, and he wanted to be able to dump it wherever he wanted to. The feud escalated when the city began imposing fines on Marvin, which he refused to pay. Things reached a tipping point when the city approved a zoning variance for the construction of a a concrete plant on the lot next door to Marvin's shop land which he had actually owned and sold to the concrete company. Marvin complained that 
construction of the concrete plant was blocking access to his shop. He complained to the officials, and they responded by fining him $2,500 for not having a septic tank on his property. Now, in hindsight, it is at this point that Marvin snapped. He didn't just get mad, though. He got even. Excuse me. He essentially disappeared into his shop for over a year. Until one day, June 4th, 2004 to be exact, he drove out of his shop in this. Marvin had taken a bulldozer and turned it into a tank. He had added layers of steel with high-strength concrete sandwiched in between. He mounted three different guns on his tank. He had cameras mounted behind three inches of bulletproof plastic. I don't want to see anybody taking notes right now. Just <laughs> he, uh, so he, The cameras are attached to monitors so he could steer from within his, his cab. He added an air conditioner so that he wouldn't die from the heat of the engine. Marvin was completely sealed within his tank. And to this day, no one's completely sure how he managed to get inside and shut himself in so completely. For two and a half hours, Marvin rampaged through the city of Granby, Colorado. He destroyed the concrete plant, the town hall, the local newspaper office, the home of the former mayor, a hardware store, parts of a service station. He crushed dozens of cars, destroyed landscaping and trees. He shot out transformers and tried to blow up propane tanks. Miraculously, no one was killed or injured, but no one knew how to stop him either. State police had exchanged gunfire with him on several occasions, and it was just useless. The governor was called, and he was considering sending an Apache attack helicopter with Hellfire missiles to take out the tank. But before it got to that point, Marvin blew out his engine and got stuck halfway through demolishing the hardware store. Now, the story does unfortunately have a tragic ending because Marvin took his own life before police could arrest him and take him into custody. Now, as crazy as that story is, there's something in us, if we're honest, that when we hear a story on some level, we kind of sympathize with Marvin. Maybe we even admire him just a little bit. And since these events, Marvin has actually become something of a, a folk hero, a symbol of someone who has reached his limits and took justice into his own hands. <clears throat> because that's really what this is all about. It's about justice. Marvin felt he had been wronged. He felt he had been treated unfairly. He thought he had been treated unjustly. And he tried to get justice through the system, but as he perceived it, the system failed him. So if he couldn't get justice through the legal system, he would get justice through the only means he knew how, his own means. See, we're hardwired to seek justice. It's inborn within us. It's written in our DNA. And if you doubt this, I would suggest a simple experiment. Go back to the four- or five-year-old classroom and give one kid a king-size candy bar and give all the other kids fun-size candy bars and just see what will happen. You will see the cry of justice right before your very eyes. We were made for justice because we were made in the image and likeness of God. And God is a God of justice. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 says, His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Psalm 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. So God is a God of justice, and because of that, we are also commanded to pursue justice. Isaiah 1.17 says, Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Micah 6.8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. So justice is good and the pursuit of justice is godly. But there's an important distinction we need to make. We're called to pursue justice for others, but we're not called to pursue justice for ourselves. The problem is when we pursue our own justice, it too easily slips from seeking justice into seeking revenge. Too often we say we want justice, but what we really want is revenge. And let's be real, were Marvin Heemeyer's actions really about getting justice or were they about getting revenge? 
He may have thought he was getting justice. It may have started out looking for justice. But when he didn't get justice as he defined it, when justice was perverted and thwarted, in his mind, the desire for justice gave birth to something much darker, the desire for revenge. And there's a fundamental difference between justice and revenge. Justice is godly. Revenge is not. Which do we pursue? And Peter's concerned about this very issue because wherever God's people have tried to live in faithful obedience to Christ, whenever they've tried to live in submission and surrender to Him, they have experienced injustice. The Scriptures tell us that we are in a war. And it's a spiritual war, but it's a war nonetheless. And the Bible tells us that we're living in enemy-occupied territory. We're trapped behind enemy lines. And as we're seeing right now in Ukraine, war isn't just. Bad things happen in war. Innocent people get hurt in war. War, in its fundamental essence, is unjust. And so if we're living in a war zone, we're going to experience injustice. This is a fact of life and something that Jesus himself promised to us. Luke 21, 17, Jesus says, You will be hated by all for my name's sake. And in John 15, he says, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We can't escape this fact. We'd like to, especially because for a long time we've lived in a land in a country where we rarely, if ever, have faced injustice for our faith. But that's changing. And many of our brothers and sisters around the world and throughout history are all too familiar with this idea. And so Peter turns his attention here in the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3 to two groups of people who understood this better than most. <clears throat> that being slaves and women. And here I think there are two basic questions that are at the core of what Peter is getting to. Two basic questions that he's asking. And while Peter poses these questions in the context of slaves and women, it's abundantly clear that the application of that answer applies to all of us. And so here's the two questions that I think Peter is asking, and they're there in your notes, and feel free to follow along. The first is, do you have enough faith to let God fight your battles? And the second is, do you love Christ enough to follow his example? I think these two questions are at the core of the entire passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, and I think actually at the core of all of 1 Peter. Do you have enough faith to let God fight your battles, and do you love Christ enough to follow his example? So with those two questions in mind, let's Go back to the text and consider some of the things Peter says. And we're going to start in verse 18 of chapter 2. It says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Peter starts with instructions to slaves. And I, I think we once again need to stop and give a little bit of background and context here. And there's also an issue that we kind of need to address. It's been noted that here in 1 Peter and in other places like Ephesians and Colossians, that the Bible gives instructions for slaves to obey their masters, but nowhere does it tell masters that it's wrong for them to own slaves. So the issue is, and the question, or maybe the charge that's been laid, is, is the Bible condoning and supporting the institution of slavery? Well, now this is an obviously serious and complex question, and it's beyond the scope of our time this morning to fully address. But I do want to give a couple of quick thoughts. First, I think we need to avoid the temptation to try and blunt the problem by saying that slavery in the Roman Empire was nothing like the slavery that we're familiar with here in the United States. There's an argument that's made that slavery in the Roman Empire was more like indentured servanthood. And while there are a couple of key differences between slavery in the Roman Empire and the institution of slavery as we're familiar with it, Uh, One of them being notably that slavery in the Roman Empire was not focused on the subjugation of a particular race. Uh, In the Roman Empire, any race, any ethnic group could find themselves as a slave. One of the other things that was a little bit different is that overall, in the Roman Empire, 
Slaves had more opportunities to achieve their freedom, and slavery was less likely to be a permanent, lifelong condition than it was in the American South. (coughs) However, slavery was still slavery in the Roman world. And there were a lot of slaves in the Roman world. 10 to 20% of the population was enslaved. Slaves were still personal property. A master could do with his slaves as he saw fit. They had no real rights. And treatment of slaves was almost entirely dependent on the whim of the master. To give you one little snapshot of slavery in the Roman Empire, there's a historical account of a slave who revolted and killed his master. And his master happened to be a Roman senator. Now, the Senate held a trial, and in that trial, they decided to uphold a particularly barbaric Roman law. And the emperor, who happened to be Nero at the time, supported it. And that law said that if one slave struck and killed his master as a deterrent, all the other slaves had to be punished. And so every single slave that that Roman senator owned was executed because of the actions of one slave. So we can't get out of our quandary by arguing that slavery in the first century really wasn't that bad. Rather, we have to remember that the Bible is both descriptive and prescriptive. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Bible is descriptive in that sometimes it is simply describing things as they are. It's reflecting the reality of the culture and the times within which it is written. Slavery was the reality of the ancient world, and it was a universal reality. The Bible describes this reality, but it doesn't prescribe it. In other words, the Bible doesn't institute, demand, or prescribe slavery. It simply recognizes the existence of slavery as a reality of life, and it therefore prescribes instructions for how to live as a Christian within this reality. And this is where Peter comes in. Because one of the realities of life as a slave was that generally you did not enjoy freedom of religion. Whatever religion your master practiced was the religion that you were expected to practice. Now this was obviously a huge problem for slaves who became Christians or Christians who became slaves. Maybe you were fortunate and you had a master who was gracious and tolerated your new religion, but maybe you didn't. Maybe you had a master who demanded you worship the gods that he worshipped. And when you refused, he began to abuse you and mistreat you, maybe even threatening your very life. And into this context, we find the words of 1 Peter 2.18, Slaves, be subject to your masters. And again, we're left with this question of whether this was an absolute command. Should slaves obey their masters, period? Well, by the same principles we've applied the last two weeks, The answer should be obvious. Now, of course, this command isn't absolute. For a slave, there was an authority higher than their master, and to that authority is owed ultimate allegiance. But God, in his authority, tells us as much as you can, while recognizing my ultimate authority, submit to the authority of your masters. Even when you're mistreated and even when you suffer unjustly. We are told that as Christians there's great value in suffering, especially suffering unjustly. This is a really hard thing for us to wrap our heads around, especially as Americans. We are so justice-oriented. We're consumed with our rights. This is hard for us to comprehend, much less apply. Suffering is one thing, but to patiently suffer for doing good, to suffer unjustly, that rubs against every fiber of our being. I remember my first real experience with injustice, and this is almost embarrassing to, uh, to share, that this was my big story of injustice but it's, it's what I can remember is the first time I really realized that the world can be an unjust place. I was probably in my late teens, I was maybe 17 or 18, and I had just gotten a checking account and a, a Mac card, a debit card. And I'd gone to take some money out of an ATM machine to go out to eat with some friends, and the ATM machine told me that I was overdrawn. And I thought, well, that's not right. I had just deposited a paycheck, and I thought I shouldn't be overdrawn, and 
So I made some phone calls and figured some things out, and here the paycheck from my employer had bounced. Well, that was frustrating, but I got that straightened out. It was just kind of a clerical error, no big deal, no harm, no foul. Kind of figured, great. Until a month later, when I got my bank statement. And I went, I tried to balance my checkbook. Now, you millennials, that's a thing we used to do. You'll have to ask someone older what that is. But um, I was balancing my checkbook, and I saw that my bank had charged me a fee for my employer's bounced check. I thought, oh, how is this possible? I, I was just, I was livid. I was so mad. I thought, I didn't do a blessed thing wrong. How in the world is the bank charging me a fee and a penalty for someone else's mistake? And I was fired up. I was ranting and raving about this. I didn't understand how banks could get away with it. I still don't understand how banks get away with it. But <laughs> it, my mom was just sitting, listening patiently to this and just nodding along and basically going, it's just the way it is. You know, that was the first time I really experienced injustice. And it's kind of embarrassing because that really kind of shows you how sheltered my life was as well. Let's talk about first world problems. But yet at the same time, it still illustrates that innate sense of justice that we all have. We don't need anyone to tell us when we've been unjustly treated. We don't need anyone to explain it to us. We know. And when we have been wrong, when we have suffered injustice, it's also born within us the desire to vindicate ourselves to prove that we were right, to seek redress and restitution and even revenge. And that desire can be powerful and it can be overwhelming. Just ask Marvin Hemeyer. And Peter understands this. He understands our human nature. I mean, don't forget, Peter has experienced great injustice himself. He's been imprisoned multiple times just for preaching about Jesus. He's seen friends killed for their faith. Peter understands the pain of injustice and the desire for revenge that it can spawn. But Peter also understands the transformative power of the gospel. He understands that the call of the cross is the call to deny ourselves. And that includes denying our need for personal justice or vengeance. And so we're called to a revolutionary response to injustice a response that's contrary to our very nature, a response that's only possible when we're submitted to the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And so as we look in verses 20 and 21, and sorry, that should say 1 Peter chapter 2, 20 verses 21, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Now it's at this point that Peter has obviously moved way beyond just talking about slaves and masters. I mean, this may have been what started all of this, but it's pretty obvious by now that Peter is talking about all of us. And his instructions here apply to all believers. And you don't get a pass just because you're not a slave. This applies to us all. We are all to respond to unjust suffering with patient endurance because we have been called to this because it's the example that Christ left us. Now, as I was studying this, I realized that this is at least part of the answer to a question that's always bothered me. And so here's the question. Why did Jesus have to suffer and die? Now, understand, I know why he had to die. I get that part. He had to give his life as the atoning sacrifice. He had to pay the price for my sin. He had to satisfy the justice of God. I get that, but why did he have to suffer? Jesus could have been executed with a quick, clean, relatively painless death. He could have been beheaded or something like that. He would have been just as dead. He still would have satisfied the justice of God. He still would have atoned for our sins. So why was the brutality there? Why the torture why the unnecessary suffering? Peter tells us at least part of the answer is right here in 1 Peter. Christ suffered for us, Peter says, to leave us an example so that we might follow in his steps. Have you ever thought about that? The reason Jesus endured such agony on the cross, the reason he suffered so much was so that we could learn from his example. 
Christ suffered horrendous unjust punishment because he knew that we would suffer horrendous unjust punishment and he wanted to give us an example of how to patiently endure in the face of suffering so that we might follow in his footsteps. And we must always remember where his footsteps led. The same destination that Christ calls all of us to, to the cross, to self-denial, to self-sacrifice, to submission and to surrender. This is why God is pleased when his children patiently endure unjust suffering. It isn't because God is some sadist who enjoys watching us suffer. It is because when we patiently endure unjust suffering, we are showing the fruits of a surrendered life, of a submitted life to following Jesus. It isn't that God finds our suffering pleasing. It's our attitude and our heart in the midst of it. Because in our patient suffering, we declare that we love Jesus more than our vindication. We declare that we love Christ more than our need for justice. We declare that we love Christ more than our comfort or our security. This is also why our unwillingness to patiently endure suffering is such an offense to God. When we cling to our personal sense of justice, when we become so obsessed with our rights and with our comfort and with our security, when we hold these things so dear that we're unwilling to surrender them, what are we communicating? Are we better than Christ that we should refuse to suffer for doing good? What are we willing to forsake for Christ? Are we willing to lay aside our claims for justice for the love of Christ? Do you love Jesus more than your need for vindication? Think carefully before answering. Moving on then, in chapter 3. It says, likewise, wives, be subjects to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. <clears throat> when they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So look, there's really no way to be politically correct or culturally popular. No matter how we parse this passage, Peter is telling us some things that absolutely go against the grain of our cultural understanding of gender roles and identities. Now having said all that, though, I do think there is a little bit more going on here, and that's a little bit more nuanced than maybe some of the more conservative side of us would like to believe. So what is happening here, and what does it mean for us today? I think it's important to note that Peter right away in verse 1 says, likewise. Other translations may say, in the same way. Peter's directly connecting his instructions to slaves and to wives. He's equating them. And I think precisely because at this time in this culture, there were a lot of similarities between slaves and wives, especially for Christians. In one way in particular, their situations were identical. Neither slaves nor wives enjoyed the freedom of religion that we enjoy today. Freedom of religion wasn't the norm in the first century Roman Empire. In this time and place, whatever religion the male head of the household followed, the entire household followed. That included slaves, that included children, that included wives. Sorry. So if a woman chose to follow Christ, but her husband still worshipped the Roman gods, this caused quite a bit of conflict, a serious conflict for the wife. There was a cost to follow Jesus in this time and place. Sorry, computer's acting up. There was a cost to follow Jesus in this time and place. We have been so insulated from this that it's hard for us to fathom and understand. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has said, when Christ calls a man or woman... He calls them to come and die. And we take that as allegory or metaphor. But for an awful lot of believers throughout history, this was literal. And this was certainly true to those who Peter was writing to. To choose to follow Christ was a life or death decision. And Peter's writing to women who had chosen to follow Christ, knowing that their unbelieving husbands could divorce them, could kick them out, could beat them, abuse them, possibly even kill them because of their faith. So what is Peter's advice? Submit yourselves to your unbelieving husbands and try to lead such gentle, submissive, loving lives that perhaps you might win over your husbands through your quiet, submissive dignity. 
Now, there's a couple of clarifications. First, this command to submit or subject yourselves to your husbands is limited to within the marriage relationship. Peter's not making a blanket statement that all women are to subject themselves to all men. That isn't what it says. Men, there's no expectation that you should expect submission from any woman who isn't your wife. The concern here is the marriage relationship. Peter says women who are believers but whose husbands aren't should, one, stay married to their husbands if their husbands will keep them. Their faith isn't to be used as an excuse to abandon the marriage covenant. And two, they should be concerned about the salvation of their husbands and their witness for Jesus. Second, as with every case we have looked at in 1 Peter, this command to be submissive is not absolute. It is to be normative, and it's to be the default position of wives, but it's not absolute. There is a time when submission ends and when a wife must obey the authority of God over the authority of her husband. Now, a little note here on verses 3 and 4. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on a gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Now, there are certainly Christian traditions who have looked at these verses and interpreted it to mean that women should never wear gold jewelry, should wear makeup or external adornments or braid their hair, but I think they might be missing the mark. For one thing in the Greek, it's clear that Peter is saying women should not only, or as some translations say, they should not merely adorn themselves with external adornments. And Peter here seems to be echoing the popular cultural understanding of the day. At this place and time, it was understood by secular philosophers, they all argued that excessive, ostentatious adornment by women was not admirable and illustrated a lack of moral character. This was probably mostly due to the fact that culturally women who dressed in showy, fancy dresses wore excessive amounts of jewelry, did up their hair, did makeup, were typically almost always prostitutes and oftentimes religious prostitutes. So Peter basically agrees with the contemporary standards of the day and says, yes, women should dress modestly and with decorum. But he doesn't stop with the external. The culture was obsessed with the external shell. Peter minimizes the outward, focusing less on the external than his contemporary secular counterparts do and focuses more on the internal. Peter's more concerned about the heart than he is the hair. And so Peter argues that true beauty is much, much more than external adornment. And if you want to be beautiful in the eyes of God, worry about your heart. Worry about your attitude. Worry about cultivating a gentle and quiet spirit. Peter says that is true beauty. And then finally in verse 7, Peter turns his attention to husbands. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. The same contemporaries who said that women should dress modestly also taught that women were weak. They believed that women were weak physically, weak emotionally, weak intellectually. This was still a very sexist society that did not value women. Women's weakness in the eyes of the culture at the time was a reason to demean and denigrate women, to treat them as less than, to treat them as second-class citizens. And Peter takes the contemporary understanding of women and turns it on its head. He says again, likewise, or in the same way, and I think he means here that while women are to behave towards their husbands with gentleness and respect, in the same way men are also to be gentle and respectful towards their wives. Peter says that they are to live with understanding as the weaker vessel, It's an interesting phrase, weaker vessel. In Greek, that word vessel literally means a piece of pottery. And the Greek word weaker means physically weaker. And it can also mean without influence. So women are physically weaker than men. And at this time, they're also weaker in terms of influence, status, and position in Roman society. But Peter says that rather than being reason to demean women or to look down a woman, to treat them as second-class citizens... Christian husbands should give them honor and regard them as equals in Christ. They should elevate women. In Christ, we are co-heirs. In Christ, we are one. And this idea is so important that we're even told that men, that the way you treat your wives directly affects your prayer life. If you want your prayers to go unhindered, if you want God to hear your prayers, live in understanding with your wife. Honor your wife, respect your wife, value your wife, cherish your wife. 
One last note on this issue of submission between husbands and wives. And men, there's something that you all need to understand, and this is critical. Submission must be given, never taken. You cannot demand submission. It's never your place to enforce submission. Hear me on this. Even Christ does not demand or force our submission. Rather, He invites us into submission through His sacrificial love. And men, we need to follow Christ's example in this. As it says in Ephesians, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Finally, to wrap all this up, let's look at verses 8 and 9. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. I want us to focus here in the end on verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called. And I want to end by going back to my two original questions. Do you have enough faith to let God fight your battles, and do you love Christ enough to follow his example? I really do believe that this is the two questions that are at the heart of this passage. I began this message by telling you about Marvin Hemeyer and his bulldozer. Marvin was pushed over the edge by what he perceived as an injustice, and he left behind some journals explaining his motivations, and in one of those he said, I was always willing to be reasonable until I had to be unreasonable. Sometimes reasonable men must do unreasonable things. I actually agree with Marvin. Sometimes reasonable people do have to do unreasonable things, and I think Peter would agree with that as well. I think we would just disagree over what those unreasonable things are. For Marvin Hemeyer, in his own words, a reasonable man, his unreasonable deeds involved a homemade tank and mass destruction. Peter would say our unreasonable deeds look quite different. We are also called to act unreasonably. It's unreasonable to stay silent in the face of personal injustice. It's unreasonable to bless someone when they're cursing you. It's unreasonable to respond to hate with love. None of that's reasonable, but it's what we've been called to. We don't seek vengeance, we seek blessing. We don't curse, we bless. We don't repay evil with evil, we repay evil with good. It's the most unreasonable thing anyone can be asked to do, but we are asked. And we're asked because our Lord and Savior did exactly that, and we're to follow his example. And so I ask again, do you love Christ enough to follow his example, to suffer unjustly, to repay evil with good, to turn the other cheek and go the extra mile? Are you willing to take up your cross and follow him? And with that, do you have enough faith to let God fight your battles? Do you trust him enough to wait for his justice? Because God is just and all wrongs will be righted. All injustice will be judged. All things will be made right. And that includes the injustice that you have suffered. We all have hurts. We all have wounds. We've all suffered injustice. Some of us more than others. We all want justice and we all want to be vindicated. And we want to be declared innocent and see justice done. Do you trust God to vindicate you? Do you trust that the God who judges perfectly and without fault will settle the matter and make all things right? that he will vindicate you, that justice will be done. This is why we can forgive. This is why we can bless instead of curse, because we know that God's justice will prevail and that his justice will be done. And it's not our problem. It's not our burden. We don't need to seek vengeance. We don't need to seek our own vindication because God has got it, and he will handle everything in his perfect timing. So one last time, do you have enough faith to let God fight your battles? And do you love Christ enough to follow his example? Would you stand with me for a benediction? And I am going to read Psalm 34, which is the passage that Peter closes this section quoting. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. 
The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. You are dismissed. <laughs>